I got a new Lego piece. You win? Um, no thanks. I've got a gaming smartphone. <sighs> this, my friends, is the Nubia Red Magic 3. Let's take a look. Ah, uh, good people. So, I really have not played this many hours of Android games until the Nubia Magic 3 came into my life. And exploring the ecosystem of games is both rewarding when you find something actually good because the Play Store is filled with garbage games and pay to win games. But when you do find those occasional times when you actually do enjoy something on a gaming phone, the experience is actually pretty good. Now, the thing is, the specifications on this phone are really impressive for the price point, around $500 US for Snapdragon 855, eight gigs of RAM, 128 gigabytes of storage. We have a 5,000 milliamp hour battery, a 48 megapixel camera, which is not great. Given this is a gaming phone, the gaming features or the gaming center is actually pretty impressive. And so I want to really explore the question, are gaming smartphones worth it? With long battery life, an NVIDIA MX150 GPU and Intel Core i7 processor in a compact design, the Razer Blade Stealth 13 is a great companion for users on the go. If you want more gaming power, hook it up to the Core X eGPU with support for both AMD and NVIDIA GPUs. The Razer Blade Stealth plus the Core X, the ultimate power couple. So first of all, how would you even classify a gaming smartphone outside of targeted marketing and demographic? Because I feel like gaming smartphones right now are just performance machines for performance users in the gaming disguise. And it's relevant because Razer has a gaming smartphone, so does Asus. And I feel like this whole gaming category is actually quite important to push certain features forward, like massive batteries, powerful SOCs, lots of RAM and storage, and most importantly, high refresh rate screens, and push all those features into the mainstream and basically create an ecosystem that makes it comfortable to game on a mobile device. And I feel like Nubia's execution here is pretty fantastic. So I guess design-wise, a gaming smartphone must look the part. It is very different versus the sleek glass backs or simple aluminum shells. RGB lighting toe seems to be quite common in the gaming sector. So the light strip on the Nubia is both expected and very pointless. Razer and Asus did the same thing with the Illuminate logos at the back, so I guess this is a trend. Even the fingerprint sensor is this weird shape that unfortunately is kind of slow for the hardware. We also have a cooling fan installed inside the frame that you'll not find on your regular Android smartphone. It is slightly audible when you put your ear to it, but with speakers blasting you know, above 40%, it is not really an issue. Interestingly, it does in fact keep the SOC slightly cooler versus my similarly spec'd out Zenfone 6. And here's the deal. The Snapdragon 855 and Adreno 640 is a fantastic combo that is also found on the new Samsung Note 10s, which are much higher priced. And this hardware is actually pretty awesome for demanding titles like PUBG, Asphalt 9, World of Tanks, and others. And the, interestingly, when I compare the benchmarking scores between the Zenfone 6 that also has the 855 and Adreno 640, the Zenfone 6 is faster in the physics test, but all the other benchmark tests are pretty on par with the Nubia. But these are just benchmarking scores, you know, whatever. And in terms of real world scenarios, I have not noticed any difference even between my OnePlus 6, it is slightly older using uh, older hardware as well. In majority of games, no difference between the Nubia or the OnePlus 6 outside of like PUBG and maybe Asphalt 9, like a little bit of extra performance in terms of frame rate on the Nubia. But it doesn't really matter. And that's the thing for majority of games on the Play Store, they're designed to work with whatever Android smartphone you have, regardless of the specifications, except for really demanding titles like PUBG. So with the Nubia, because of the powerful hardware, you get a visual advantage and you also get a performance advantage by having better FPS, so you can aim better. And that is the only incentive to go towards like a gaming smartphone or a phone that has better specs. It is a good thing that the phone is absolutely massive with an almost 6.7 inch display. 
so that when you hold it, because of the aluminum shell, it is kind of slippery. I would love to have a little bit different texture, especially on the sides to really give you a little grippiness over here. The phone charges via type C. There is a headphone jack up top. And we also have this red toggle on the side that activates game mode. And this is something that is actually kind of cool. So enabling it gives us access to the full library of games and this is like game mode only. You can disable incoming phone calls, incoming messages, incoming notifications and all that. So you will not be disturbed as you game. So swiping from the right, you can see we have that full command center reveal. So you can enable your fan. You can disable the LED strip since it's completely pointless. You can also toggle between those notification options. You can also change between different performance modes, but in my benchmark testing, they don't really make any difference. And a really cool 4D shock feature. So for example, playing Asphalt 9, the phone literally gives you that haptic feedback about the music and the bass, which um, is actually kind of cool. The vibrations are pretty strong and it feels like you're almost holding a little controller in your hand instead of a smartphone. I also love the temperature notification plus any network activity and both the CPU and GPU frequency. And it's actually kind of cool because as I game, I can swipe from the right to see the temperature of the SOC and GPU and CPU clock speeds, which I guess makes sense to see on a gaming smartphone, but not like you can overclock the CPU or GPU independently anyway, but it's still kind of cool. And you use the same red toggle to get back into your desktop away from that command center. And probably the most useful feature are the touch buttons. And that's because we have two capacitive triggers on top for left and right. So inside the game, you can map exactly what left and right does on screen. So for example, in PUBG, you can uh, map the right trigger to aim down sight, which is super useful. You don't have to navigate your thumb away from shooting. You can simply tap the trigger on the right. This is especially cool for games that have a lot of happening on screen and if you have a lot of touch controls so you can free up that real estate from your thumbs onto your point fingers via the triggers. And given the screen is 90 hertz, that is absolutely incredible for this price point given not many high-end flagship phones even have high refresh rate displays. The catch however is that not many games support 90 hertz refresh rate because they have to be running at that FPS as well. So if I'm running anything demanding like the Asphalt 9, World Tanks, uh, PUBG, I am 100% not getting 90 FPS on the mobile phone. So it feels like I'm 60 and below in majority of the really demanding titles. But in terms of gaming with something really demanding, I don't feel a difference between this and my Zenfone 6 that has a 60 Hertz display. But I think majority of people will just enjoy the 90 Hertz display outside of the gaming arena because not many games support it. And the fluidity you get with just basic operations is absolutely amazing. Scrolling through something or touching something is awesome. I do have a few complaints about the screen though, like the rounded corners. I feel like they're way too rounded. They cut off some of the UI, like the battery percentage and the clock. For some reason, when I open my folder with all my games in it, the animation is super laggy despite having a 90 Hertz display and a really powerful SOC too. There's no way to change the refresh rate of the screen to anything lower than 90 Hertz, which I find odd. It'd be nice to have the option to do so. And weirdly, there's no way to disable the capacitive trigger buttons when you're outside of gaming mode. So if I'm watching a YouTube video and they accidentally brush against one of those trigger buttons, the menu will show up because YouTube thinks that I just touched the screen. But given the size of your phone, you can go into landscape mode directly on your home screen. I feel like this size of the phone is absolutely perfect for precise aim. So in PUBG, when you need to land those headshots, easily achievable on this phone. The same thing with World of Tanks, when you need to penetrate those pieces where the tanks don't have armor because the phone is massive and your, your thumbs or your Trigger fingers are not blocking anything on the screen. We do have a stereo set of speakers, which is nice, but the bottom one on my unit is much louder. So when I'm gaming, the right channel is just blasting audio at me while the left one is uh, a bit muted and it kind of removes the whole stereo effect. As for using this on a daily basis outside of gaming, it's too big for my pocket, but it's Android. You could customize it to however you like to use your phone. The only few issues I have with the software is the camera app. It's both laggy, there's shutter delay, and there's takes way too long to actually process the images once you take them. The actual detail of the image with a 48 megapixel sensor is pretty good. Dynamic range is there. Sometimes it likes to underexpose a bit, but in terms of having a really nice sharp image is great. The selfie mode, that thing has impressed me a lot. Uh, nice detail as long as you disable the whole pretty effect. So the cameras are good, but they take kind of forever to 
process and the camera app is kind of laggy. And so in the end, I would say this is a pretty complete gaming package for the price point, especially with the Snapdragon 855 that is found on the Zenfone 6 and the new Note 10s. It is really impressive what this thing can do in terms of battery life at 5,000 milliamp hours. I've played for an hour at full performance mode and I only lost 20% of battery. So that gives you five hours on non-interrupted gaming like Asphalt 9, PUBG or World of Tanks, which are super demanding on a smartphone. It's pretty good. And to come back to the question of whether or not gaming smartphones are worth it, in my opinion, yes, they need to exist to push certain features into the mainstream, like the priority for me would be the higher refresh rate screens. Razer did it, Asus did it, OnePlus did it with the 7 Pro, Nubia is doing it. Man, be great if more companies did it too. Ah, so that is my experience with the Nubia Red Magic 3. Check out my favorite Android games down below, something that I've discovered along this journey of trying to see what games are worth it uh, to experience on the gaming device. And let me know what you are playing right now or if mobile games are totally not for you. But I'm Dimitri, thanks so much for watching. I'll talk to you in the next video.